Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we had around about 65 people registered for the event tonight. So we're just giving a little time to make sure that people um, are able to get on. Uh, if you're able to and haven't already, can you please put your microphone settings on to mute? Because it just makes it a lot easier um, if the phone rings at your house um, that we don't get interrupted, that would be great. Um, and we will get started uh, very shortly. Okay. All right. So um, for those of you who don't know me, no, my name is Helen Oakey. I'm the Executive Director of the Conservation Council ACT region. Um, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging the country that we're meeting on today. Most of us probably are meeting on today and certainly the country on which the lands that we're talking about today are located. Um, the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We'd also like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal people who have connections with the lands in the ACT and the surrounding region. Um, we'd like, I'd like to also just um, make mention tonight and welcome um, Peter Kane, MLA. I can see Peter is there, he's logged in for the event. Peter is one of um, the newly elected members to the Legislative Assembly uh, in the electorate of, uh, oh gosh, I've just had it total. I never remember that one. Ginninderry, sorry. <laughs> in the electorate of Ginninderry um, uh, for the Canberra Liberals. So Peter, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Helen. Uh, okay, so this evening we are going to be discussing the topic of the Lawson North grasslands. And the purpose of the event is to gain a broader understanding of the proposed development at the former Belconnen Naval Transmission Station in Lawson North and the areas around that. Uh, this, this block, this area hosts one of the largest, well, the largest grassland in the Belconnen area, and it's home to many threatened species, including the golden sun moth and grassless, uh, grass, grassland earless dragons. My apologies. Uh, so tonight we're going to explore the details of the development and we're going to also um, have some presentations about the important species that call this grassland home. Um, and we've got three, well, we've got two presenters really, Jeff Robertson, who is the current president of Friends of Grasslands. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the collaboration that the Conservation Council has had with the Friends of Grasslands um, over the last few months working on this, on this issue. Jeff is the current president and he'll first outline proposals of the development, including where the development's located and what the impacts will be. And then uh, Ryan and Ray Winkle, who's also a member of Friends of Grasslands, will highlight the conservation values of the site, uh, including the unique species that are found there and their importance in grassland ecosystems. Um, then we will, as a perils of technology, I've got messages coming in on my computer, my apologies. Um, and then we will discuss the evolving campaign that's taking place, talks about some of the things that people can do and also allow time for questions and any additional insights that people might have with regards uh, to the site and, and what they know about the site and, and what they might know about the processes going forward. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat panel. Um, it really helps us if there's lots of questions, if you can put the word question in capital letters in front of your question um, as we said before, please keep your microphones on mute. Um, if we don't have a lot of questions rolling in and if, it's not, if we have time and space, we'll definitely throw to people to ask the questions themselves. Um, if we have a lot of questions, we might curate those, but I might read those out. So we'll see how we go. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So Jeff, as I said, a current president of Friends of Grasslands, which is a community group dedicated to the conservation of natural temperate grassy ecosystems in southeastern Australia. Friends of Grasslands, or affectionately known as FOG, uh, have a strong involvement in local grasslands issues with a diverse member base, including scientists, landowners, land managers, and members of the Canberra community. So at this point, I'm going to throw to Jeff Robertson. And Jeff, if you need, would like to share your screen, and we'll let you know if that's all working and that you are off mute. <laughs> Sorry, I seem to. Thought I had it ready, but it's not. Here it comes. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Helen and Maddie, uh, for arranging uh, for arranging this. So we'll just get on with it. So the 
for those of you who are not familiar with Lawson, um, this is Lawson just north of the Belconnen uh, Town Centre. And the area we're in is the area that I've highlighted as the, uh, the Naval Transmission Station. Jeff, yeah. I think your um, presentation may not be playing yet. We've got it actually, the, the screen that you shared with us is one that's got your folders on it. You uh, might just unshare that screen and go back into a different screen. All right. Sorry. Uh, okay. Is that better? That's the one. And if you press play, you'll get it without all the extra stuff around the edges. Fantastic. Okay. That's perfect. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, so the first slide was just a, a nothing slide. So looking at the area of Lawson, which I said was just north of the Belconnen Town Centre, and the area we're interested in is the Naval Transmitting uh, Station, which is, which is marked there. And for most of that, you see it, it looks pretty bare in the screen. That is essentially uh, grassland. And then this area uh, with the bright green in the middle, that was the area that was the settlement uh, for, the, uh, for the base. And in the middle of the base, you can see a little red thing. That's a, a red building, which was the actual uh, radio station itself. And then they had a lot of aerials and things uh, around it. The area we're particularly in, interested in is the uh, area to the to the right. That's on the uh, that's on the east. Now here's the same image again. Uh, obviously, it's uh, it's greener, but I want to draw your attention to the uh, what I call the National Capital Authority, Authority Development uh, Control Plan, uh, developed in uh, September 19, uh, 2012. And it was published in, sorry, I just want to get rid of these people so I can see the screen. No, no doesn't work. Uh, okay. And it was published in uh, February, I think it was uh, 2013. Um, having a bit of problem. I want to get rid of, oh, if you, if you can, uh, on my screen, I'm getting something that I've got a lot of people, I want to get rid of them. So I can actually see Jeff, that, Jeff there should be a, a minus button with one there of those. Is. Press the minus button. There is, but it's for some reason there it is, but I can't seem to get access to it. All right, I think I know what's there. Anyway, the um that that's the map out of the development control plan, and it shows you these areas A, B, C, D, and E. I'm having problems with this. Uh, everything's jammed up on my screen. Can you hear that little? Mm. It seems to be working at our end, Jeff. So what? What are you? What are you looking at? Uh, we've got the two photos next to each other, and then the A, B, C, D, E areas are marked on the right-hand side. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm doing this from memory now. Um, Okay, so the area A uh, is marked, it says there's a lot of community facilities uh, in that area, which, will, which could be redeveloped. Then the area B, which is where the uh, housing was previously, they say that is suitable for housing. Um, part of that area B, um, there, at that time, there was a, uh, exotic grassland and a little bit of natural temperate uh, temperate grassland. Area C is a wooded area which they say can be used for kangaroo shelter uh, and then D uh, is natural temperate grassland and E is, um, I don't think they quite describe it as that but it's, a, it's actually a, a woodland. Now um, are you on to my next slide? We passed that slide. No, no, still, still on slide two, Jeff. Okay, um, I might have to come. I might have to come out of this. Stop sharing. Start again. This is not. Sorry, this is not, not working. Jeff. Yeah. Would it be easier if Maddie shared the presentation for you? Yeah. Okay. 
She's just getting up the link. All right. So if you want to unshare your screen for the moment. Ah. There you go. A year of Zoom meetings. We still haven't quite conquered all the technology. Can you stop? If you stop me sharing, because I can't seem to. Uh, yep. We'll stop you from sharing and Maddie can bring it up on her screen. Okay. If you can do that. Yep. All and right. maybe you can just talk to her until he went to move move through. Okay, so go down. Oh, sorry, you've got to go into play. Then we'll go down. Yeah, if you go through a few slides. Yes, next one. Next one. Okay, so that was, I've just been through that one. The next one. So this shows you the, the plan in the, the control plan. And then what I put up here is the, uh, is the ACT map I. And um, if you can understand this, uh, it shows what is the, uh, what's at these various areas. So you can see that purple, uh, that, that purple area, that's an urban area. The areas that are yellow, uh, natural temperate grasslands. Um, the areas that are that light green are exotic grasslands. So that means uh, weeds. Um, and then there are various areas around the, uh, around the fringe. I wasn't able to determine exactly what it was, but as you can see, the, the larger part of the area is natural temperate grassland. There's some area which are uh, introduced grasses, uh, which are uh, which are weeds, but that's the vegetation map that the ACT government now has on its website. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so the next thing I wanted to emphasize was wants to show is this map, which comes from the ACT grassland uh, strategy, and this is the only map they have in there for Belconnen. But you'll see the area of Lawson, and you'll see the uh, that, that bright or that navy blue area there, which is say describe, which is natural temperate grassland, and they describe that as uh, having a conservation significance of a category one uh, grassland. Now that grassland is um, over a hundred hectares in size, and it's really important that we save all our large uh, grassland. So the proposed development will cut uh, cut into that. In the ACT, we're very privileged to have a number of large grassland sites, and this is one of 11. The species they mentioned are on that, si on that side of Button Wrinkle Wart, uh, GP, oh, Ginandera peppercress, uh, Golden Sun Moth, uh, Parunga grasshopper, and Striped Legless Lizard. By the way, Helen, there's no grass grasslandless dragon uh, on, this, uh, on this site. So you can see from the development control plan, they put this area aside for conservation. And then this has been adopted in the ACT grassland strategy. Can we have the next slide? Okay, so in June of uh, last year, we were made aware that um, DHA had a proposal to undertake uh, development uh, on this site. And, um, and there's a timeline that they showed us down there. I don't particularly want to pay much attention to that timeline, but they were very optimistic. And they said that actually start construction of the, uh, of the development at this time or uh, in February this year. So, um, so I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so the Con Council and, and Friends of Grasslands organised the letter to go to DHA, and we had 30 organisations sign that letter and 80 individuals. And with apologies that we didn't uh, approach all the people that are sitting in this room, but uh, in future, we would like to get your signature on things as well. Now, we, we put that in, uh, I'll just go to the, sorry, can we go to the next slide? That just is an indication of the people that we sent the letter to. So we sent it to the to Barry Jackson, who's the MD, and to Sandy McDonald, who's the chairman of uh, Defence Housing Australia. Then we sent it to the Minister for Defence and the Minister 
for the environment. Um, defence personnel, it's one who actually looks after DHA. Uh, to the ACT Minister, Mick Gentleman, Sally Barnes, National Capital Authority, Sophia Lewis, who's the ACT Commissioner for Sustainable Environment, and Professor Arthur Georges. So we want to get a fair bit of coverage for this. We've had three responses back and we also had some press coverage. Um, can I go to the next slide? So now we start to look at what what the proposal is by DHA, and it has uh, it and it's proposing to uh, a development in two stages. The first stage being uh, stage one, as they call it, and you can see uh, what the what the sort of development they want to put uh, they want to put there. Now, if they can find it to that, that may be acceptable, given already that the development control plan put out by uh, the National Capital Authority said they could go ahead with it. Can we have the next slide? However, this is what they propose for stage, uh, for stages one and two. Um, and as you can see, it, it, it cuts into a lot of areas of natural timber grassland, those areas D and also area E to the right hand side. That large area that was D before has now been cut, uh, has now been cut in, uh, in half. So in response to our letter, um, we have learned they've gone back to the drawing boards, but we can expect to see another proposal at some time and we can't predict when that will be. Can I have the next slide, please? So what can we expect? Um, we can expect something to appear under the EPBC Act. Exactly what form this will take, and uh, we're not sure. They might suggest they do the whole, they put up the whole site that they want to develop under that, or just the part that hasn't been approved, or that the part that uh, that um, that doesn't have the sorry, it's only the part that doesn't have the natural temper grassland on it. Uh, there'll have to be a revised development control plan at some point that will go through the NCA. We've talked to the NCA. They see themselves as, as the facilitators of this, uh, but um, the people there have actually encouraged us to keep ahead, going ahead with this. And then eventually it has to go to the ACT government because these will be developed into suburbs. And, the, uh, and if the ACT government is going to manage this site, uh, then they'll have to agree to take it on. Okay, that's where I want to finish and let my colleagues um, do the rest. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, so we will have time for questions, so please keep them rolling in and we'll have a, a bit of a discussion afterwards, but we might just throw straight to Rana now so that he can run us through what the ecological values are on the site. Um, so Rhina is Rhina Raywinkle is a local grassy ecosystem ecologist, and we've been very lucky to have his expertise on this project. Um, he's a member of Friends of Grasslands, acting chair of Kosciuszko to Coast, and member of the Wandiyali Restoration Trust. Rhina has worked on grassy ecosystem conservation since the early 1990s, and he retired from the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage in 1995. Um, Rhina, over to you. And I think that Maddie's going to share your screen as well to keep it simple for you as well. Yes. Thank, thanks, uh, Helen. Look, I did make a big mistake there. 2015, not 1995. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> I have to say, I, I read out what I'm given and I read that one out and I thought, gee, you've had a great life, <laughs> great oh, retirement. <laughs> yeah, a great long retirement. It's only been six years. <laughs> now <Fair> time flies. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen. Okay, can everybody, all right. Oh, all right, can everybody hear me? Can I, I'm not too sure, I'm not getting any feedback. Can everybody hear me? Um, yes, we can hear oh, you. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so um, our next slide, thanks, Maddie. So look, I'm I'm just going to give a pretty 
rapid overview of all the threatened fauna, flora and ecological communities, plus some of the declining species that have been recorded either on the site or in the neighbouring um, suburbs of Canberra. Uh, as Jeff has pointed out, North Lawson has extensive grasslands and patches of woodland. Um, and I think I'll just skip that next bit because Jeff's covered that pretty well. Next, next slide. Uh, just to reiterate uh, the areas in question, um, so we can move on to the next site. The uh, next slide. Thank you. So the most um, the most extensive community on the site is natural temperate grassland. Uh, the natural temperate grassland, for those who don't know much about the community, formerly occupied half a million hectares of southeastern New South Wales at the time of settlement. Now, uh, according to the calculations that I did for the um, natural temperate grassland uh, conservation advice under the EPBC, less than 1%, that should be less than 0.1%, I don't know where the five popped up from, that's a mistake, less than 1%, sorry, less than 0.1% of the, the previous extent is protected in conservation reserves. Let that sink in, that's a very, very small amount. Um, of course, grasslands, as Jeff, Jeff has, has pointed out, provide habitat for threatened fauna and flora and, and a very large number of declining species. Grasslands have been and remain vulnerable to land clearing for agricultural infrastructure and urban development, and that's straight out of the uh, straight out of the uh, conservation advice. And why is North Lawson important? North Lawson has a very large area of NTG, as Jeff's pointed out, and part one, part, part of the stage one proposal will affect some very very high quality natural temperate grassland, and. If stage two ever goes ahead, it will affect an even larger area of natural temperate grassland. Okay, next. The second critically endangered ecological community uh, is box gum grassy woodland. I won't go, I won't give you the full name, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it also formerly occupied extensive areas of land from Queensland right to, to the South Australian border and beyond. Very little of the community remains in high quality. Uh, it has, like grasslands, has been and remains vulnerable to land clearing for agricultural infrastructure and urban development. And that's also in the uh, out of the recovery plan, uh, out of the um, conservation advice. And why is North Lawson important? Now, it doesn't have as much box gum woodland, but there are actually a number of patches, including it's derived grassland form. So that area that Jeff referred to as area E is actually derived grassland with a few scattered trees. It, um, stage two of the development will actually impact on that. Um, the woodlands in the Southwest uh, areas in the area D, uh, they have large hollow bearing trees. And of course they're very important for hollow using birds and mammals. Um, and the woodlands, from what we can see over the fence, I haven't had an opportunity to go on there to have a look at, in, to have a close look, but the woodlands at North Lawson have a diverse ground layer, which is important under its um, its uh, formal listing. Next, thank you. So there's just, just a few picks of the um, of the sort of things you see in woodland. Beautiful grassy ground layer. Um, lovely mature trees, a beautiful iconic landscape, some fantastic wildflowers and the one in the middle is the bush stone curlew which is being successfully bred over at Mulligans in the woodland there. Mulligans of course being the um, predator-free pre predator fence um, reserve uh, and that does point out another threat to the fauna of woodlands and grasslands. Next, thank you. So moving on to the fauna, and we'll start with the lower orders, the invertebrates. The golden sun moth is probably the most well-studied fauna species at um, North Lawson. 
Uh, it's a critically endangered species. It's a day flying moth of natural temperate grassland, which is formerly widespread. And now very much depleted, very extensive range contractions. It has an uh, unusual life history with a long larval lifespan. So the caterpillars or the grubs live underground for a long period of time. And then they emerge for just a few days as non-feeding adults. It's a dietary specialist on the roots of uh, wallaby grasses and spear grasses, and it doesn't eat while it's um, in its adult stage, as you can see. Uh, why is North Lawson important? Of course, the golden sun moth has been considered a flagship species of the southeastern Australian natural temperate grasslands. It's an unindicator species of undisturbed grasslands, which sort of tell, tells us a bit about the quality of the grassland itself. The site contains extensive interconnected suitable habitat with one of the larger remaining populations in the ACT with a maximum of about 500 individuals counted over an area of about 120 hectares. So it's, it's very important for, for that species. Next, please. <clears throat> There's a picture of um, a, a female golden sun moth. They sit on the ground, uh, slashing their golden orange wings in the hope of attracting a male. Next, please. Three other invertebrates have been flagged as being important at Lawson. The Parunga grasshopper, um, I've been told that it's called the cross-dressing grasshopper because it has a cross on its back, which is quite um, unique, a good identification feature. It's a restricted grassland specialist and has been recorded at North Lawson. It's a vulnerable species. The Canberra raspy, uh, now up till now, all those species that I've mentioned are um, listed under the EPBC Act, the Commonwealth Act. Where I've indicated um, ACT or New South Wales, it means that they're less listed either in New South Wales or ACT, but not on the Commonwealth list. Canberra Aspie Cricket, um, not listed yet, is nominated as to be listed as endangered. Also a restricted grassland specialist, and it's recorded at North Lawson. Um, it's a flightless um, cricket, very unusual cricket cricket and there's other species um, the most important one is the keys match dick which is not listed in uh, act it's endangered in new south wales it's a restricted grassland specialist and it's highly like it hasn't been recorded but it's highly likely to occur next please now to the reptiles um, the striped legless lizard is a vulnerable lizard it's not a snake it, it doesn't have legs but it's in a class uh, in a family all its all its own unrelated to snakes it's actually a lizard there have been limited surveys for this species at north lawson and there have been two captures from uh, two records from that from that site so that's one of the more important um, of our reptiles the canberra grassland earless dragon now this is a newly recognized species it was formerly simply known as a grassland earless dragon. Now it, had, it has been split into four, three or four, four separate species. And therefore it qualifies for listing as critically endangered because the four species were um, lumped together as one species, which was un endangered under its current, which is endangered under its current taxonomy. It's not known from North Lawson, though North Lawson has been flagged as a potential release site for the establishment of a new population of this species. The habitat at North Lawson would be ideal for the, for the species. Next. <clears throat> Now we move on to the birds. The superb parrot is a vulnerable um, woodland dependent parrot. This species has recently extended its range to Canberra um, and there are certainly records from North Lawson and the nearby suburbs. Whether it actually has bred at North Lawson is uh, hard to say because no, there's no access, but there's certainly suitable habitat there. There's certainly suitable foraging habitat for this species. The Latham snipe, um, a migratory species protected under Commonwealth uh, law and also under international trip, uh, migratory bird treaties. This species breeds in the Northern Hemisphere and visits our region uh, where it's a non-breeding visitor. 
There's potential habitat in the lower lying areas of North Lawson. Uh, it likes wet, wet grasslands. And I, I have records from Lawson and there's certainly other records from nearby areas. Next. And um, other birds uh, of lesser importance in terms of their listing status. The gang gang cockatoo, which is only listed vulnerable in, in New South Wales, but how it's a iconic ACT breeding resident. Iconic because it's used as a symbol for ACT parks and conservation amongst others. It has suitable foraging and breeding habitat at North Lawson. Um, and I've certainly recorded it flying over North Lawson and in nearby suburbs. Same for the little eagle, it's a vulnerable species under new ACT legislation. Um, a very small population remains here in the ACT. There's suitable foraging habitat at North Lawson, um, and certainly there are record, records from North Lawson and nearby by suburbs. And finally, or maybe not finally, Scarlet Robin, a vulnerable ACT species. Uh, again, an iconic insectiv insectivorous woodland breeding resident. Iconic because everybody loves um, Scarlet Robin. It's become a bit of a flag flagship species for conservation of small birds. There's suitable foraging habitat at North Lawson. It likes open woodland uh, and grassy verge, uh, grassy edges to open woodland. And I've recorded it at North Lawson and it's certainly um, here, especially in the non-breeding season in, in and around the nearby suburbs. Next. So there's other threatened species. The white-winged triller is a vulnerable ACT species. Uh, again, a migratory species with a breeding population in Canberra, although, uh, although small breeding uh, population. There's certainly su suitable breeding and foraging habitat at North Lawson, and I've recorded it um, in, for example, in plantations in, sorry, Woodland Sea in Jeff's map. Just by the way, that woodland, so-called woodland at sea is actually a plantation rather than a woodland. Uh, dusky wood swallow, which is vulnerable in New South Wales, a nomadic insectivore that breeds in the ACT, formerly very much more common. Now you only ever see ones and two or two, up to 10 birds at a time at least, uh, formerly in huge flocks. Suitable foraging habitat exists at North Lawson, and I've recorded it at North Lawson and in nearby suburbs. And the white fronted chat, which I recorded recently. <laughs> Um, at Lawson, and it's a nomadic terrestrial honey eater, a regular visitor to Canberra, and it has uh, certainly suitable habitat in the low-lying grasslands of North, of North Lawson. Okay, next. So that pretty much covers the listed species, but there are a whole bunch of other declining birds. Uh, and I've just listed the ones which have popped up in my consciousness in terms of what I've recorded or what other people have told me are there um, or, or what have been uh, recorded, uh, especially through eBird, which is easily accessible. So there, there you can see quite a la large list. Some of them have been recorded at Lawson, North, sorry, at North Lawson, others in nearby suburbs. Next, please. Moving on finally to the flora, uh, Jeff mentioned the Ginandera peppercress. It's an endangered species, uh, Commonwealth Act. Uh, it's a rosette forming perennial forb with small greenish flowers. It's not much to look at. That picture that I've got there is not actually Ginandera peppercress, it's a related species. Um, North Lawson is very important because this is a highly significant species at this site. This is the site of its first discovery hence Ginandera peppercress, Lepidium ginanderensi. Uh, North Lawson is known as the species type locality. There are still only four known populations left in the ACT and they're all in the ACT. It's an ACT endemic. Um, it's highly, uh, highly likely to be overlooked in surveys because it's one of these things that can pop up and disappear. So it's possible that plants may occur in the development envelope or as a dormant seed store. Next, small purple pea, an, an endangered species. Uh, it's also limited to a few small populations in New South Wales, ACT, formerly Victoria as well. 
I found a new population at Lake Ginandera um, last October. So it's likely to occur anywhere if you look hard enough for this, for this thing. Uh, so it's likely to occur at North Lawson. The hoary sunray, of course, everybody knows that beautiful white everlasting daisy, an endangered species on the Commonwealth Act. It's a widespread species. Um, it's sensitive to disturbance. It, it does occur on res Reservoir Hill directly opposite North Lawson. Next. And finally, um, like as we have declining woodland birds, we also have declining grassland flora. Uh, these, these species are common to both grassland and woodland. Um, they're called, they're termed decliners because they, they're rare due to the same threats that operate on the box gum woodland and natural temperate grassland that they occur in. And the species include such wonderful little things as a nodding chocolate lily, the common bulbine lily, the blue devil, emu foot, which I found in another plant just opposite my house just the other day here at Lawson, heathy bush pea, early nancy, creamy candles, lemon beauty head, scrambled eggs and austral sunray. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Maddie, if you want to just skip two slides and just leave it on that last slide for a minute so people can appreciate the beauty of the grassland flora. Very well, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Rana. Um, it certainly is lovely. Now, I also, just before we keep going, I thought what we might do is throw to questions um, for both you and for Jeff with regards to the biodiversity on the site, the management on the site and any other things that are sort of biodiversity related before we move back into the campaigning um, sure. issue and what's happening, um, if that's okay with you. Um, well. I've, just before we do that, I'd just also like to welcome, I can see um, Joe Clay, MLA, also on the line there, um, also a newly elected member from Ginandera. Uh, welcome, Joe. Um, and... Okay, so I'm just going to throw over to, well, I've got a couple of questions that have come in from Peter about the land. We might go back. Has anyone got any questions around the biodiversity values and what we know about the site? Um, and if it's okay with you, Rana, I might just kick off with one, which is um, how much do we know about this site given that it's been in the 10 year of defence for some considerable amount of time? And how does that leave us... Um, lacking knowledge about what might be there and and what are the op opportunities to find out more that's a really good question uh um the 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 issue is that nobody from any of the government departments have been on there for a long time apparently uh we have we're fortunate in having and i won't mention their names three people um in associated with fog who um, had worked for the ACT government. So they do know a little bit about what's there and, and what reports are available. Um, and most of that information about the fauna comes from those people or from uh, also from a consultant who's worked there as well. Um, I have um, snuck on board to have a look at the grasslands. Uh, apparently a lot of people from Lawson walk, walk um, onto the site uh, for, for uh, daily exercise. Uh, there's a, a gate, an open gate and a pathway through. So I've taken the opportunity to go on there and have, have a close look and have taken some photographs. Um, so I can pretty much vouch for the quality of the grassland. Um, but in terms of um, what's actually there now, uh, I, I think we need to rely to some degree on the consultant who, the ecological consultant who worked for Tate, the company who's acting on behalf of Defence Housing uh, Australia. Um, I haven't, we haven't been privy to the report. So um, what, what they've actually looked at and how they've looked at it, um, whether their surveys have been comprehensive, whether they've covered all the fauna species and all the flora species that, that I've covered. And admittedly, I've, I've left off button wrinkle work. Um, up till now, I was unaware that button wrinkle work was on the site. So that do, we've been getting dribs and drabs of information from people who used to work for the government. Um, and um, yeah, so it's sketchy at very best. Uh, fortunately, you can walk right around the edge of the site. So I've been able to assess the quality of woodlands and whether they match the uh, criteria required for EPB listing, and they certainly do, 
including the secondary grassland, the derived grassland in the, in the northeastern area E. I hope that answers part of your question, Helen. Yeah, thanks, Rana. Um, I've got a question from Daryl. He says, under current arrangements, what limits the expansion of exotic grassland SPP? I'm sorry, Daryl, what's SPP? NTG areas. Oh, sorry? It's species. SPP is short. That's right. Okay. Uh, look, that's a, really, grasslands. that's a really good question. Um, I have, a, I have many years uh, grassland ecologists watch these things and um, there is a bit of an ebb and flow and it depends on the management and it depends largely on nutrient flows as well. So the higher nutrient loads that you'll get in some grasslands, the higher the exotic cover will be. So for that reason, you'll get um, exotic grasslands growing vigorously down drainage lines and immediately above the drainage lines, um, miraculously, the grassland turns native. Um, in terms of uh, invasion, yes, there are certain things like African lovegrass and um, St. John's wort, uh, which can in, and can and do invade into native grassland, particularly if the grassland is being disturbed. Disturbances include inappropriate mowing regimes, heavy grazing, things like that. Um, as far as I can, well, in my walks up there, well, for example, the um, it, to their credit, defence housing has engaged con con contractors to spray the serrated tussock within the um, area D that I've seen. Um, I haven't seen any African lovegrass. There's a little bit of St John's work, but yeah, look, it's it's a big story. But the um, quality of the grassland at um, North Lawson, I think Sarah was Sarah Sharp, who um, most of you will know, was concerned and she expressed the desire to go on there once, probably about three years ago, she, she told me that she'd like to go on because she knew that it was a high quality site. And I've, I've had the opportunity now to see it. And the uh, Thermida grassland, the kangaroo grass grassland in the east in area D in the east is really superb seems to be very, very resistant to invasion. Um, I guess that's a bit of a brain dump, but um, yeah, uh, I think if, um, if that person wants to be more specific, um, I'm happy to, to answer that question. Okay, I'll leave him to put that in the comments. Um, Jenny, you made a couple of comments in the, in the chat bar. Would you like to share those with everyone out loud? You're, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I've caught you on the hop. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I found it. Um, when we first had our discussions about this site, I did ask Laura Rayner if it was a significant site for superb parrot, because that's one of the species that gives us some leverage with respect to the EPBC mm -hmm. Act, um, because it's listed as vulnerable. Um, and generally, if there's, you know, major breeding sites or major feeding sites, you have a chance of protecting them. Uh, and she said it's not a significant site, although of course we're aware that there are records of birds in and around the area. Belconnen particularly is a, a reasonable hotspot for the parrots, although they are now occurring all over Canberra, really, right down in Tuggeranong and oh, down as far as Hoskinstown, I think. Um, and certainly the, the, we have a, we've had an influx of them since, oh, oh 2005, I think, um, and it's thought to be climate related. That's all. Uh, can I just respond to that just briefly? Um, having travelled a lot um, over the last 30 years up into the core breeding habitat of superb parrots, the threats to superb parrots in their New South Wales range are still certainly ongoing. Loss of hollow bearing trees, yep. uh, particularly roadkill during the um, harvest season when they swoop down onto the roadsides after grain that are spilt from trucks. Um, it's not unusual to see dead birds on the, on the roadsides during that time. So um, I think we need to probably a little, be a little bit careful in saying, oh, Can Canberra's, you know, they're all over Canberra. I think their range is possibly contracting south, contracting southwards rather than extending southwards. Uh, sorry, let me put that a different way. 
it, it may be that their range is actually contracting southwards rather than extending southwards, which means that they're just shifting rather than um, uh, increasing their range. Yeah, I think that's true. Although Laura is a bit more nuanced about how she describes it, it's not quite as clear cut as that. Sure. Um, yeah. I just can't remember all the detail, sure. but uh, certainly we should be looking to any any large trees to be protected. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it is a ground feeder, so um, it's possible there are areas on that site where they may go in certain seasons to feed. I don't know. Yeah, and there's certainly large trees in that woodland in yeah. the far the area, sorry, the area D um, next to area B uh, in the south of the site, there are some large hollow bearing trees there. Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we do know the government is um, developing an action plan for the retention of mature eucalypts following the submission the council made and nominated it uh, a couple of years ago, but we haven't seen that action plan, but we should be pushing for all mature trees or as many as possible to be retained for any for any development. Um, and there are good models. Gin and Dairy, I think, has retained, what, 80% of their mature trees. Um, but the ACT government retention rate is just very, very low. It's not good enough. Thank you. I'll, I'll mute myself now, shall I? Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, um, Jenny. Maddie, can we get, grab the rest of the presentation up and we'll just move into some of the decision making processes that are happening? Yep, no worries. Just grab that up now. So, um, we've obviously ha had some conversations around the land tenure for this site and what the decision making processes are. So, uh, uh, just a quick overview the land is um, is ex-defence land and is now being developed by Defence Housing Australia as the proponent. Um, and so Defence Housing Australia is, you might just need to do, yep, the present, that's cool. And we're just on the second slide. Yep, great, thanks Maddie. Uh, so Defence Housing Australia is the proponent and is preparing the um, development proposal. Um, Tate Network is the consultants that they used to engage with the community last year, in the middle of last year, during lockdown, unfortunately. So we were unable to get um, a site visit at that stage. Um, however, the, the letter that we sent back to um, Defence Housing Australia and CC'd into all of those people that Jeff listed, obviously triggered a review of the preparation of the um, decision or the preparation of the, the proposal that was going to be put through to the EPBC. So there are two key decision-making points that um, are required. First is environmental approval under the federal, um, by the Federal Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment um, under the EPBC Act, which is Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which I know that many of you are familiar with, although not altogether trusting of. Um, and that requires um, the referral to be made for those species that have triggered, because those species are um, triggered under the federal legislation. Um, then the second part of it is that the development approval is by the National Capital Authority. Um, the National Capital Authority um, manage development approvals for all national land. And this, this piece of land has been, is identified as national land. And so um, Jeff mentioned that the, there was a development control plan that had been done in 2009, um, which effectively allowed residential development to occur on the footprint of the stage one part of the development. Um, but what is going to be required is if the Defence Housing Australia wish to take this through to stage two in their original proposal, then they need to get that development control plan would need to be um, changed or updated or re-approved because that de um, development control plan effectively rules out development on the stage two part of the footprint. Um, there are a couple of concerns around, around that, which is that the, obviously even stage one potentially has impacts on the surrounding areas of grassland due to the fact that there'll be um, edge effects that will happen as a result of the development going into that sort of boot shaped um, piece of land that reaches into the grassland. 
there's grassland on the eastern side of where the development would be that was marked for protection but would end up being such a small area that it puts it very much at risk of, of being degraded. Um, and then and then the other, so the, the other issue is if um, a suitable um, border was put around stage one or even around, well, if it, even if they just stuck with stage one and they put a suitable buffer around the edge of stage one, then that would potentially, could potentially um, result in the development not being viable going ahead because actually that would reduce the development footprint if the footprint didn't, wasn't laid, uh, sorry, if the buffer wasn't laid around the outside of stage one. So stage two clearly builds over areas that look like they have um, significant grassland values. So at this stage, what we're expecting and what we've been told is that, um, is that Defence Housing Australia have gone back to the drawing board and are preparing a development proposal that is much more sympathetic to the environmental constraints that have been um, identified and it appears that the community actually identified those environmental constraints for them because they've actually taken a good, what has it been now, six, seven months to redo all of the ecological assessments and the heritage assessments on the site. So we know that that's happened um, and we know that a second proposal is in the pipeline and what we're waiting for at the moment is for that proposal to be sent through um, under the EPBC to trigger an environmental approval. And then depending on the scope of that um, proposal, we would be expecting that they would need to also go back to the National Capital Authority to stay, to sign off on a change on the development control plan. So for the planning law. Um, so those are the decision-making points. It, it's always a bit murkier when it's um, the fed, federal land. And the question has come up and it's a question we've asked ourselves as well, is then what happens um, with regards to when the land is handed over to the ACT for, for managing, because what we're talking about is a new, effectively a northern suburban area of Lawson. Um, we know that about 50% of the housing has been proposed for defence housing families and that, um, and that the other 50% would be general release to the community and that the ACT government would end up being the managers of that suburb as per other suburbs in the ACT. So where the ACT government role kicks in, in terms of um, approving or accepting or, or engaging in a discussion with Defence Housing about handing over the management of that suburb is a little bit unclear to us at the moment, but it's certainly a conversation that we're gonna be having with the ACT government. Um, we haven't had clarity from um, everybody in the ACT government that they're opposed to this project going ahead. There were some statements made prior to the election. So um, I think that all of the parties are definitely aware of the proposal. I think that the Greens came out and said that they didn't support development happening on the site. And I think we had a less equivocal response from um, both Labor and Liberal um, pre-election. But obviously those are conversations that are ongoing with all of the parties. Um, do you want to just go to the next slide for me, Maddie? Oh, okay, so this is a little bit about how people can get involved and what's coming up, and then we'll go back to the questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, so basically um, there's a petition on the Conservation Council website that people can go to and sign, which we've just launched today and we'll start promoting from here, um, to um, Barry Jackson, who's the Managing Director for Defence Housing Australia. Um, we've also been engaging with the Lawson, the local Lawson community and the Hello Lawson group, um, who, who are very supportive of the position around protecting the grasslands. And there's going to be a Lawson Market Day. Oops, I've left the date off. Sorry, it's March the 27th, isn't it, Rona? 24th or 27th? 27th, yeah, March 27th. 27th, yep. 8, 8, 8, 8.30 till 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock at Lawson. Yeah. And there'll be a community event that day. And so there'll be some stalls there um, that we'll be talking to the community about what's happening. Um, if people would like to um, volunteer, we'll have opportunities to volunteer on stalls or do some letterboxing. We're also keen to actually, um, we're also keen to um, engage with the community in Kayleen, which is the surrounding suburb to the north as well. Um, and then both the Conservation Council, the Hello Lawson Facebook page and Friends of Grasslands Facebook page are places where you can um, follow on Facebook and get updated information. 
uh, assuming that all their Facebook pages have been restored, which I think they have now. Um, so the things that we're really keeping an eye out for coming up is the EPBC referral. And when that happens, then needing to make a submission to that process. Um, and we'll also look at ways of getting the community engaged in that. Um, and then also keeping an eye on the development control proposal and the NCA process following that. And Viv says, don't forget the Girilang community. Thanks, Viv. Won't forget the Girilang community. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to just uh, duck back to the questions. I'll just leave that page there for people if they need it. And I'm just going to go back to the participants, uh, sorry, the chat bar and see if I can find if there's any more questions coming through there. Um, so, Larry, the question was, why hasn't the ACT government ruled it out yet? Um, I think it's because at the moment they think that it probably isn't quite their business, but I think what we need to do is find out how it is their business and where their opportunity is to rule it out. And it's certainly that that's certainly an ongoing conversation that we'll be having um, with them. Um, I'm just running down the list. Uh, so from Gordon, would the areas that we want we want put into a reserve have to be fenced off from people to protect the habitat or could it be used for any form of recreation, e.g. putting in walking paths? Um, I'm going to throw to uh, you, Rainer, or you, Jeff, for that one. Yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a go at that. Um, there's no proposal to put a fence uh, around it, although longer term that would be uh, quite a great idea, but a fence could also allow human traffic um, to, to go inside. We have a similar situation at, a, at Franklin Grassland where we are trying to, um, to improve that site. It has a lot of high quality values on it, but we're also trying to get the neighbours to come in. So the, a thing that they've got happening in Melbourne where they've got similar situations with grasslands with suburbs around them is to uh, allow people to come in, but the concept is to put the grassland uh, put grassland conservation first. So the answer is yes, you can do that, but you wouldn't want to be turning it into uh, heavy use um, type of thing. So it needs to be careful, needs to be managed subtly. Also, if you're putting pathways in, you can put them in in such a, such a way maybe that they keep people off the grassland and keep them to areas where they, they won't disturb things. And it's probably worth mentioning at that point, Jeff, that there obviously there is an area that's been disturbed right through the middle of oh, the yeah, site yeah. and so there's opportunities there for potentially putting in community um, facilities or environment engagement facilities or or you know um, opportunities for the community to learn more about the grasslands but not actually necessarily impacting heavily can i can i add something there helen yeah sure yeah just just a, a very bit of a clarification i uh, stage one will actually impact some very high quality grassland um, and the issue with development in a donut shape, as that would be, it'll leave the area to edge ratio area to edge ratio of the grassland enormous, which is an extremely poor poor thing to have in a conservation planning context. Uh, we've had various discussions um, around the table about some sort of alternatives that could happen in that um, area, that uh, area B where there's exotic trees and there's an old roadway and uh, apparently even a mess hall and various other um, in infrastructure bits and pieces. Um, a lot of the trees up there are, are exotics. Some probably need to be removed like the metal trees. However, I, I and it's quite scenic. If you go up there and have, have a look, it's very, very scenic and I, I can see great opportunity to build a park, parks or community facilities like tennis courts or perhaps a swimming pool, things like that, uh, with the grassland reserves um, well and truly buffered. Um, the conservation advice suggests the minimum of 30 metre buffer. Uh, I'd, pretty, I'd, I'd like to see a lot more there because of the quality of the grassland. Um, people at Lawson have been expressing the idea that they don't have a shopping centre and things like that. Um, over at Downer, people not, might be aware of the wonderful little community facility that's re, been redeveloped at, in the old shopping centre at Downer. That's the sort of thing that could very easily be um, built on, on that site without having impacts over the grassland and the woodland. So, you know, a place for the community to meet, um, cafe and uh, art centre and things like that. I think there's plenty of scope for uh, positive development up there. 
without uh, without having another suburb with all the impacts that that would mean. Um, somebody, one of our group um, has suggested um, that North Lawson would make a fantastic predator-proof predator project, or, uh, sorry, predator-proof reserve, the predator-proof fence and management of a grassland. We've got the model there at uh, Mulligan's Flat. We've got model, model down there at um, Wandi Alley on the old Coomer Road at Queanbeyan. So we've got, uh, we've got a number of woodland reserves for the protection of woodland fauna and flora. Uh, it seems to me that um, North Lawson would make a fantastic predator-proof fence reserve for the protection of grassland fauna. Um, that's, that's just a few ideas which have been floating around. Thanks. Thanks, Rana. And I think that um, just points to the fact that what we're hoping to do is having an ongoing conversation with the local community as well, um, who are very much in sort of in this space, collaboration space around the, the grassland protection is important um, and that we can't put anything on that. You wouldn't put anything on that site. I guess the challenge is going to be about um, how that becomes then financially viable. If, so if the development doesn't go ahead, then obviously there needs to be some decisions made about the site um, for that to then become something that potentially the ACT government might want to use or, or in a different way. Um, but at the moment we have Defence Housing Australia have tenure over the site. And so that's going to make this quite challenging for in the short term. But in the long term, um, I think there's lots of really positive ideas that we've that we've people have put forward about how it could be how it could be utilised in an effective way or parts of it could be utilised in an effective way. Indeed. Um, and I think, I think it's important to re remember that defence housing have, have ownership of it, but it's not worth anything to them until it's sold. Yep. They don't, they don't um, okay, they do manage it by weed spraying and stuff like that. But that, the only value to, it, to them will be if they sell it. Um, it's not as if they're, they're a poor organisation. I, um, I think we need to be, be aware of that issue. Um, I've just got a comment in the chat bar that the community should have an opportunity to respond to referrals um, to the Department of Environment for the proposal. And I think that's right. Under the EPBC, that's what we'd be expecting. Um, so it's just waiting for that referral to come through um, to the Commonwealth uh, for the environmental approval. So yes, that's, that's definitely an opportunity there. Um, commentary about the, um, this not being in the parliamentary agreement. No, it's not in the parliamentary agreement. Um, unfortunately, there's very little about biodiversity in the parliamentary agreement. Um, unfortunately, except in the green section, there's a little bit, but um, it, it sort of felt like biodiversity really got looked over in the negotiating negotiations for that agreement. Um, so I'm scrolling down. Joe is saying, I thought it was formal position, Joe, that the Greens were opposed to the development. I hope I haven't misrepresented that, but that was my understanding um, is that that was a formal position. Um, feel free to clarify if I've got that wrong. No, that's, that's right, Helen. Yep. Um, I will find out what we do with that next. Yeah. Um, and I suspect I'll have a bit of a team chat tomorrow that will probably be in promoting this campaign, um, putting something up on the website and then using some of our other tools. But we'll have to have a bit of a chat back at this um, end about which tool. You. Maybe one of the things that you could help with is to, yeah, identify where those points are that the ACT government gets engaged. Um, but that's certainly something that we'll be talking to the minister for, as the minister for planning and, well, <laughs> I'm trying to remember what else he's minister for at the moment. Parks, parks and cons, but planning. At least I know that bit. So, mm. um, minister, gentlemen. Uh, so a bit of a chat about trees. What have we got? We actually submitted in 2008. Sorry, I've just skipped over. Things are jumping around a bit with glasses in debt search. Oh, an idea for a kangaroo and wildlife sanctuary. Um, I'm expecting that if I put the issue of kangaroos, then we're going to be having a conversation around potential risks of overgrazing. Um, has the land already been transferred to DHA? I, I think it's defence land from a long time ago. I don't know what the internal processes are between defence and DHA but DHA are definitely a separate agency. Um, and it's possible even that DHA might be the kind of agency that the government's thinking of privatising. They're definitely just a land developer. Um, so one would assume that that has happened, but that's, um, that's a good question that, and which Peter raised as well. And I think we need to go back and um, find out what, what is happening behind the scenes there. 
Um, is the development a foregone conclusion? Um, not if we make enough noise. I think that Defence Housing Australia have certainly lost a development proposal up in Queensland at Mount Lofty recently, but it was a long and protracted fight. And I think I could be wrong, but I think it's always it's always very difficult. Um, well, it sometimes seems to be very difficult to get people really excited about some of our local biodiversity because people don't seem to connect with it the way they do kangaroos in big gum trees, uh, koalas in big gum trees for some reason, <laughs> which is what was going on at Mount Lofty. Sorry, not kangaroos. I'm doing lots of misspeaking tonight. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just seeing. Okay, uh, Marie has asked a question about could the ACT government purchase it to use it as a potential future offset site? Um, I might put that to you, Jeff. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, one way or another, this, the, the major part of this land will come to the ACT government for it, uh, for it to manage. Um, I guess they don't want to be doing anything until they know uh, more clearly what's, what's happening. I don't know if that answers your question, Marie. So basically what you're saying is that, well, see, I don't know if it's about purchasing mm -hmm. either. So, I mean, land tenure in the ACT is a bit complicated, but I'm not sure that, yeah, I I'm, I'm suspect the NCA might want something in return if they were to hand over the land to the ACT. But yes, it's not, it's not clear how that all happens as has been recently demonstrated. Now, there's, there is a long-term, there's been a long-term understanding that this land, the, the major part of this land will go to the ACT government. When we were talking to in that Tate network consultation, DHA um, were proposing that uh, they give the land to the ACT with some money to uh, look after the rest of it as a form of offset, which I don't think is an acceptable offset. Uh, so I don't think there's any uh, there's any question about the ACT getting the bulk of that land at some part at some stage to look after. The question is, what will it ask uh, by way of finance to look after that in the long term? Okay. Or equally, equally relevant, what would be lost to what would be lost to develop to save Lawson, which is a tricky question in terms of offsetting, because offsetting always implies that you lose something to gain something. Mm. Yeah, I was just thinking about that because I was thinking about this whole offsetting issue the other day and I think that that's probably the risk. Um, and, um, and I think another risk involved here would be that um, should we fail in our campaign, they'll probably offset what they've lost and they may very well offset it into what they've already got, which is, again, is probably totally un. un um, um, ethical, if nothing else, uh, or or if they don't offset into North Lawson, then they'll offset somewhere else. So we're losing some really high quality grasslands for another reserve somewhere else. And who knows? And and because it's a Commonwealth development, it could be anywhere. It could be in New South Wales. Mm. Um, Brett, I'm not sure I quite understand. Oh, sorry. The Brett's made a comment about the site has a history of kangaroo fertility control, an excellent site for this to continue. Does anyone want wish to comment on that or reflect on that? I guess the, the assumption there is that it retains its existing fence. Um, so the bit that is fenced, uh, who knows what the plan is for that, but what Brett is suggesting, I think only works if they keep that fence. My understanding was that the fertility control programs weren't working in open sites that they needed to be contained. This is, sorry, most of the site is contained at the moment. Yep. Yep. Um, okay. Um, so I'm just trying to read. So, does anyone else have any other questions that they'd like to drop in? There's a bit of there's more commentary than questions. Um, so I'm just trying to read, there's some quite long bits of text in the comments. Okay. Um, Helen, I've got a new comment from Helen Sims. Maybe you should get her to... Helen, do you want to sort of speak to that? Mm. 
I know you're there. <laughs> uh, yep, there you go. Yeah. Helen, Helen, this is Viv. Can I just comment as a, a local resident of Girilang? I just think I put it in my comments before <clears throat> that a, a lot, um, if you actually want to have impact in terms of saving this grassland, I think a lot more has got to be done about actually informing people what is there. Because from my mind, only a, you know, it, it's not well known <clears throat> amongst local residents of um, the biodiversity in that area. Um, several years ago, when my children were at Kayleen High, I did a grassy woodlands planting there, which unfortunately, as I passed on, probably hasn't, hasn't been looked after as well as it. But that sort of thing where you involve local schools and community around the whole thing with grasslands, you know, how much of our grasslands been wiped out and how many species we've lost. Um, because I just don't think politically you're going to sort of um, save places like this unless it's, it's more than, you know, the sort of group we have here that, that are interested. We need to do, and I think that's good that you're having the, the um, outreach thing at Lawson but needs to be more of that. I mean, you've got schools sitting right on the doorstep, like Kaylina High, you've got Marimanong, you've got Girilang. Um, that sort of outreach, yeah. if you actually get kids involved, you find the parents then um, become more educated around what they actually have on their doorstep. Because I just don't think the majority of residents around there, and they're the ones, if they get passionate, will be standing waving placards if they try and do anything to the grasslands. Yeah, no, thanks, Viva. I totally agree. I'll take that as a volunteer from you to come and join our <laughs> campaign meeting. <laughs> um, because I think you're exactly right. And I think one of the things when we said put your hand up for some letterboxing is that we wanted to start communicating with the local community in the surrounding suburbs. Um, and I think engaging with the schools is also a really great opportunity. There's a great opportunity to do that. So um, absolutely. And I think you're right. It, it's a, they're really it, they can be really difficult places to highlight the the value of and um, yeah we'll make sure that you're on that next meeting. Yeah, I think as somebody <laughs> said, people care about think about trees and think you know oh cutting down that's terrible, but they they don't realise the huge you know the wonderful things that we have in our grasslands. Yeah, Helen, can I just uh, respond to Vivian there, please? Mm. Uh, Vivian, we've we've just started a land care group in uh, Lawson and the funding that initiated the project there at Lawson was actually Commonwealth funding for grassland conservation. Uh, we've had two meetings and they're both very well uh, attended, including the first meeting by uh, quite a large number of children. So I really take what you're saying and we're, we're on the way within the suburb of Lawson at least. So it really depends on Girolang and Kayleen now. <laughs> well, well that, that, that's great. We've got quite a lot of water watch people in Girolang. Great, yeah. And oh, thanks for reminding me of that. Just um, just remind me. I think Kat might might be on the call or might have been on the call. Um, so we've also um, been engaging with the Ginandera Catchment Group. Um, they've been really active participants in this conversation as well. So um, yeah, I think that's a really some really good ideas, and and it's a we need to sort of figure out ways that we can actually go and engage with that younger audience and and in the in the suburbs around. Um, I'll go back to Helen Sims now. Because sorry, Helen. I'll... Okay. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have to see what I said. But um, uh, yeah, I think under the original act, when the land was carved up into national and ACT land, uh, the whole reason, as I said in that last statement, the whole reason for declaring land as national was that it was required by the Commonwealth for national purposes and everything else by default became ACT land which of course is still government uh, Commonwealth land, but it's managed by the ACT. But as time went on, uh, when it was uh, clear that the Commonwealth had land that it wasn't using for national purposes, there became, um, the, the, the arrangements were made between the Commonwealth and the ACT. Uh, to do land values and land swaps. 
and uh, and sometimes there was, I think there was actually cash involved too. It was all oh, was quite a long time back, uh, and um, yeah. So I, I've always thought that that's that's really crooked because you no, know, if it's if the Commonwealth doesn't need it, it should by default be the ACT government. So that's all um, uh, in response to the comments about. Uh, about ACT land, uh, with how it becomes ACT land, and, and typically there's money involved or, or value involved, valuations involved. That I mean, yeah. that, that's historical. Now I imagine it's still the same. And that's the language that they use is very much that it's managed for national purposes, and you do have to question what the national purpose is now, apart from you know, fifty percent defence housing on a you know it. I mean, I, I guess they could argue that it is housing for defence families um, and that that is a purpose and they, they have already argued that publicly, but I, I agree because it's uh, not really clear what the national purpose is. For except, them. Helen, there are defence housing properties dotted throughout Canberra and, and everywhere and they're not all on national land. No, no. But they, I think they've already put forward um, in the letter, we were, one of the corrupt pieces of correspondence we received was something about the fact that there was a shortage of defence housing in Canberra. Um, and I guess it's a tricky one because there's a shortage of housing in Canberra. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but no, I think it's, it's a really good point. <laughs> mm. um, uh, Paul has asked Jeff of the people we wrote to, who did we get a response from and could we speak to what responses we got? I don't know if you've got those letters top of mind. We got a fairly neutral response from DHA, I remember saying, thank you very much. We're going to be doing this, that, and the other as we should be. Um, talk to you later. Um, you're on mute, Jeff. Interesting. That's right, Helen. Interestingly, they also said we'll be consulting a lot of experts. So in our letter, we said, well, we hope you consult the many experts who've uh, sign this letter. The Department of the Environment just gave us one of those uh, answers which says we'll be considering all this in the goodness of time, uh, etc. And um, the third response, I can't, I'm just trying to recall who that was from. Uh, look, in any of those responses, there was no, there was no commitment. Um, other than to go uh, forward with processes and no commitment to talk to us or whatever. Can I just pick up something else? I think there's, look, there's two targets here. One is the, the Department of, the Commonwealth Department of the Environment. So the, um, it, when this comes up under the EPBC uh, referral, it has to be um, looked at on the basis of what it's doing to threaten ecological communities and, uh, and species. So that's a, a scientific audience, although we do know that under the EPBC Act, there's a lot of things that get, get through under that, which we don't uh, think should. And then, of course, if that does get through, I think the NCA would just will facilitate uh, whatever happens. They're not they're sort of not, not aligned in that sense. Then if it gets to the ACT government, I think that's uh, when we need to put pressure on them um, to, to either not accept what's proposed or whatever. Uh, I think, it, but generally with the ACT government, uh, what it's done is when something, some development uh, by the Commonwealth has got through the, um, has, has got through the EPBC Act, it tends then to accept the outcome. So we've got to sort of get them to change their thinking, or we may have to get them to change their thinking on this. I think uh, I think that's particularly appropriate because of the, the number of threatened fauna that are listed under new, uh, ACT legislation, which aren't on the Commonwealth list. Uh, things like some of those uh, uh, endemic um, invertebrates, for example. Jeff, was the, the third letter from Tate? Was it? No, I can't. Oh, sorry, I can go. No, on I think it was from Minister Gentleman, actually. Oh, it was okay. Yeah, and again, it was it was non-committal. Yeah, so we've had we've had basically a non-committal correspondence or no correspondence back. Yeah, that would be the summary. Well, I think with the ACT government, it's, it would be crazy of them to commit to anything until they see what happens with this process. Uh, yeah. They don't have to make enemies 
until I have to make a decision. So, uh, and the the letter that remember the letters were sent out um, probably well, it was August last year, wasn't it? So it was quite a long time ago and quite early on. So yeah. Okay. Um, are there any more questions before we wrap up this evening? Did you ring them after you wrote to them? Sorry, who was that? It's always a good idea to ring them after you write to them to make sure they've got it and then you have a conversation with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had to we had to ring a couple of people to make sure they got it because we weren't sure what kind of black hole we were writing in, writing into at Defence Housing Australia. It's quite hard to find people in there. But we seem to have we seem to have sorted that problem out now. So that's all good. <laughs> um, we, we did write to the scientific committee in the ACT, who uh, of course their position can't make a um, can't say publicly anything about about that. They can't prejudge it. On the other hand, I was talking to the head of the committee the other day and he said, I'll sign your petition. So there you are. Excellent. Okay, so just to wrap up, thank you. I'd just like to say thank you very much to, to Jeff and to Reiner and to all the other um, members of Friends of Grasslands and Canberra Ornithology Group and everybody else who's been involved in the conversations around this development proposal to date over the last six months. Um, the uh, Conservation Council Biodiversity Working Group has also um, had a look at this issue and we really appreciate the input and the expertise that they bring to the table. So thank you to you. Um, they, we'll keep working with Friends of Grasslands going forward um, and with uh, Hello Lawson and hopefully some of the other groups in the community. If you can bring the Giraland community along behind you and um, get us access to all those schools in Kayleen because I know there's a lot of them. Um, and I think what we're hoping to do from here is to um, build a list of people who are interested in, in um, volunteering or participating in this campaign, um, reaching out into some new audiences. Uh, we'll be at the market day, hopefully talking to the local community. Uh, and we're probably doing some letterboxing in the lead up to that market day so that if people would like to do a little bit of a wander around some of those local suburbs to letterbox some information both about market day and about the issue itself, um, then please do let us know. We obviously have your email addresses as being interested in the issue to sign up for tonight. So um, if it's okay with you, we'll put you on a list of people that we might stay engaged with in a more detailed way on this issue. Um, and if you, if you wish to unsubscribe, of course, you always can. So please let us know if you need to get off any of our email lists. Um, and um, yeah, we're just gonna basically keep an eye out for that EPBC referral. I know that Narilla from Friends of Grasslands conscientiously checks every week to make sure that those referrals haven't come through. So thank you, Narilla, for the work that you do, um, keeping us all informed about those processes. And that will be the next official part of the process. In the meantime, we're going to contact DHA again and see if they will actually bring this proposal back to the community before they take it to the EPBC. And um, we're also going to be continuing on conversations with the National Capital Authority and with the ACT government about where those pressure points are going forward. We certainly don't have all the answers, um, but it's sort of an ongoing conversation. So stay in touch and keep an eye on our Facebook page and other groups' Facebook pages, and we will let you know when there's other opportunities to be involved. Um, thanks again, Jeff and Rona, and thank you everyone for coming along this evening. Um, we'll keep these going a little bit like this online. I apologize for technical challenges. It's always really hard to do these things on the laptop as well when you don't have a very big screen, but um, thank you for your patience. And we'll hopefully see you um, next month or the month after at another environment exchange. Thank you, Maddie, as well. Oh, Maddie, sorry. I didn't say thank you to Maddie for all that. <laughs> but Maddie, you can close us all down now. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you.